Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm going to start. So welcome EE123, Lecture 23. Woo! So radios are here. Uh, actually, call signs are here, which means that we're going to give you the radios to less than half a class. So you're not getting radios for the spring break. But you are, because you showed the class. Um, so let me just show you. Uh, uh, so while, while you already license, I feel, hey, I feel responsibility of actually teaching you something before you get these things. Uh, because you could potentially interfere with people and do some damage. So I want you to prevent from doing that. Okay. So each one of you is going to get one of these boxes. Uh, photo. There you go. There you go. Each one of you are getting one of these boxes, okay? And in those boxes, you'll find. Distracting. Okay, you'll find the a radio. Okay. And the radio has a battery. You connect the battery to the radio if it's not, but I think um, they should be because what we did is we uh, programmed them for you. Okay. Uh, you have a clip, and the clip goes over here. So try to put the clip. You need to screw it in. Okay. So put the clip so it's nice. Um, you also get... Strap, so connect the strap. Can you see the video? Yeah. Connect the strap. Mm, voila, strap. The most important thing before even opening the, turning on the radio, is to connect the antenna. One of the only ways that you can damage this radio is transmitting without the antenna because it's not matched to, uh, it's not, basically it will not match. And so all the power will go back in. Okay? So connect the antenna. This is an SMA uh, uh, connector. So connect the antenna. Make sure that it's connected okay. Then you can turn it on. Okay? Uh, you've got a charger. Okay? It's a 10 volt charger with uh, this. When you charge, make sure that it's actually showing that it's charged. It's a little bit flaky. So, yeah. So just make sure that the red light starts showing up, not just the green. Okay, then it will charge your radio. There is some manual in it to how to operate it, but it's not that it's useless, but there's actually a better manual that I linked from the website. I'll show you in a second. Uh, it's a better manual. But we did program those radios for you, so they have lots of channels already built in. And we programmed some repeat, uh, local repeaters okay, for you to, uh, you can try. You turn on the radio by changing the volume. It will start. It will show you EE123 rocks. And then, and then it will set up on channel 4. Okay? That's the default channel that it will, it will set up. Um, now, what I did is um, the, there's two... Um, this radio is uh, able to monitor two frequencies at the same time. Right now, this is turned off, okay? So it monitors one at a time. The problem is that when it monitors two, it will switch between them. You're having, uh, you know, you talk to somebody, and then there's somebody on the other channel. It will switch to the other one. Then you transmit. You transmit the other channel. It's kind of complicated. So I switched that uh, option off, but you can switch it on if you really wanted to. The other thing is that I program is the upper channel, upper part of the display. Uh, you know, there's a and if you can see it, you see this this triangle here. That's uh, pointing out to this uh, uh, flipped SP Cal, SPX Cal, SPLX Cal, <laughs> flipped one. See this triangle that's showing that now is the upper channel. The upper part is really transmitting. 
Okay, that's, that's the one that you're going to be listening to. And then you can switch them between A and B. There's a button called AB. It switches between these two. So if I press AB, oh, it went down, it went up, it went down, it went up, it went down. Okay? So whenever this triangle is showing, that's where it's actually going to be transmitting. See the triangle on the side here? I press on AB, it goes back and forth between them. Okay? So when it's up, then it's, that's what it's going to be using. Okay, so one other thing is that the uh, upper one, though they're the same channel, one, uh, the upper one will show the name of the channel. The bottom one will always show the frequency. So the problem is that if I program this and I don't tell you what the frequency, to actually figure out what the frequency is, it's like requires a, maybe 10 button keys to switch to the frequency mode. So what I did is I, the upper one shows the channel, so then you can figure out which channel are you in terms of name. And then if you want to know what the frequency, you just go to the bottom one, type the same number, and you'll see what frequency it's programmed to. Okay, so it's uh, helpful. Okay, that's why I did that. Okay, uh, there's instruction of what to use uh, and so on and so forth, but, but that's pretty much it. This is the thing that you're not getting today. Those who are watching online, the rest of you are. Okay, so with that, any questions? Any questions? Okay, so then you go to the class website. And there is now a link that's active that wasn't active before, which is called radio. Okay? If you go to the radio, it tells you a little bit about the radio. It tells you how to talk. Hold the radio four inches away from your mouth. Antenna in a vertical position. Press push to talk, push the talk button, uh, and speak very slowly and uh, you know, in a clear voice. It's really important to speak in a clear voice. You're thinking that, that you're uh, you know, talking to a normal person. You're not. You're talking to somebody that is behind a radio that not necessarily sees your lips. Okay? Obviously, it doesn't. He doesn't. Or she or he doesn't. So speak very clearly and uh, pronounce each uh, vowel or syllable very, very uh, distinctly. Then you're guaranteed that the person will be able to uh, understand what you're saying. Um, wait one second before you release the PTT, after you talked. Because some people, they don't have good coordination. They drop the PTT well, just before the, the end of the last word. Okay, So do it afterwards. Um, Comprehensive instructions of how to use it. I have a link here. If you go and you'll see this is the uh, radio documentation project. And it has lots of information about this radio. Okay? And how to program it and so on and so forth. So it's really, really useful. Please go ahead and, and look at this. Again, the only way that you're going to be able to damage this radio is transmitting without. Or putting in water, right? And things like this. But. <laughs> You know that that's or breaking it right. That's another way. But really, the only way that you is uh, is transmit. So don't transmit when the antenna is not connected. Definitely don't hold the antenna when you transmit. Not that it's going to create damage, but it's pro probably not healthy for your hand. Um, what else? Uh, there's other tricks how to switch between four watts and two watts. There, there's some exp uh, thing here. Uh, repeater reverse mode, also voice activation mode, how to do this. Don't use vo voice activation. In the previous years, we used vo voice activation to do the digital uh, uh, communication. So you would transmit something, and uh, once it hears, then it turns on the transmit. We don't need this to, uh, anymore because we'll give you, uh, you, you'll be able to control the uh, transmit receive using a, uh, the USB. Okay, so into, uh, into this thing. So, but voice activation is useful, but you forget, and then you talk, and then it transmits, and it's a mess. Um, what else? Uh, yes, there's other tips. Um, for example, you know, what frequencies, so this thing is programmed, and on the bottom over here, uh, I put the table. This is not right. I, I removed the zero one, so you don't have the zero one. Um, I'll update that, actually. Oh, I 
just update the website. Let's go on. All right, so um, um, these are the frequencies that are programmed into your radio, and it tells you kind of what, what they are. And so this are, these are the names, these are the frequencies, and these are what, what they mean. Okay? So I programmed quite a bit for you. One thing that I want you to be careful is that I did program for you the uh, MURS frequencies. These are unlicensed band in the, um, UHF, in the VHF frequencies, which you could use, but only on the low power. You can only transmit in VHF and, and MURS uh, below 2 watts. Okay, I did program this for you. Uh, if you want to talk to another unlicensed person, that's one way to do this. Um, so it's useful, but no more than 2 watts. Okay, so you have to operate on low. I did program marine SOS and marine safety just for you to listen, but you don't transmit on these. Okay? Uh, and there's other frequency that we're going to be using in the class. Um, and there's a bunch of repeaters here that are programmed. And the repeaters have a frequency and then a shift and then a P uh, PL that's already programmed. Okay? So the code in order to open the repeater. Um, what else? I uh, gave you some information here about, you know, uh, for example, simplex 2M is the national calling frequency on 2 meters. If you go uh, even within Berkeley, but definitely if you go up high, you call this CQ, 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 somebody might answer. Okay, people listen to that frequency. Uh, and it's simplex, it's not through a repeater. Okay. Uh, other repeaters that are linked, or the one on the, uh, on the uh, hill here, WA6HAM, K6BLD. This one is also um, linked through Echolink. If you get an Echolink account, you can connect from, uh, to that repeater through the internet. And if somebody walking about Berkeley listening to this, you'll be able to access as well. So through the internet. N6NFI is by far the most active repeater in the Bay Area. If you press 699, um, while pressing, well, while transmitting, you'll be able to uh, get a signal report, okay? And that's one at the uh, Stanford Dish. That's where the repeater is uh, uh, located. Uh, some information about nets, especially the 9 a.m. talk net. You'll get homework to check into this net, okay? That's one of the homeworks you're going to be. Uh, this is how to program, you know, information about how to program this, but uh, don't, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, don't do it, okay? Uh, if you have questions about programming, you can get a cable. Uh, we'll have a cable uh, available for you in the ham shack that you'll be able to use it. If you need to program your radio to put another channel and so on and so forth, you can also order a cable if you want uh, and, then, um, and then modify the, the programming that we gave you. Okay. With that, any questions? So I hope you enjoy... Uh, at least in the break, play with them. You know, you don't have the interface right now, so you cannot do the, all the digital stuff that we're going to be doing later. Uh, but I think uh, it's nice that you uh, be able to a little bit experience uh, and talk on these radios. Uh, just play, you know, have fun. But be, uh, yeah. yeah. You have a license, right? So that's your responsibility, yeah. Okay. Okay. Compressed sensing. So last time we talked about uh, sampling, and we talked about what is the rate, if you know that something is band limited, but it could be anything, what is the rate that you uh, need to sample? And we said that it's going to be at least at the Nyquist rate. But if it's something and not anything, then maybe uh, there, you can actually sample at a lower rate okay, and still be able to reconstruct. And I showed you an example when we had a single sinusoid, and that was something, not anything. And I showed you that even with a lower rate, we'll be able to recover this uh, and sort, sort out certain ambiguities when you go for a lower rate if you're doing, for example, non-uniform sampling. Okay, Remember that? Then we talked about compression, and we talked about image compression. And um, this is also true for audio, uh, but the way that, uh, uh, or other type of signals, 
But the way signals are usually compressed is that you acquire all the data, and then you go through a compression mechanism. And if you think about compression, it's a nonlinear way often. Sometimes it's linear, but sometimes it's not, well, yeah. Sometimes it's linear, sometimes it's nonlinear, uh, to take certain amount of data and reduce its rate. Okay? If you think about this, rate of uh, basically we represent it using the smallest amount of coefficients or smallest amount of disk space, for example. It's kind of a form of reducing the rate also, but if you think of it, it's kind of a general form. Okay? It's not exactly sampled at the same rate. It's not. You know, but you can represent it using a smaller uh, size of measurements. That's true for um, band-limited signals, right? If we have band-limited signal, we can reduce the rate by going and downsampling them to uh, till they actually occupy the entire uh, digital spectrum, right? The DTFT. Okay, so if they occupy only a smaller part, we can reduce the rate till they, you know, till the point where they start aliasing. Okay, so that's again reducing the rate. So we can compress them, right, in some way. Now, um, in MRI, for example, this is the same same way it's done. Often done, you can take acquire all the data, reconstruct images by taking inverse Fourier transform, for example. Then you can compress this information. But the thing is, with MRI, not like CCD, which is cheap and really really fast. Every measurement takes time. If you can reduce the amount of measurements then maybe uh, you can also scan faster. And that is a big issue, for example, for this type of, uh, of an imaging. So the question is, if this is compressible, then why do I need to acquire all this data in the first place and throw most of it away? And whether I can actually sense the compressed informa information directly by making fewer measurements. And that because I know that the signal is compressible, maybe I can just go through here, sense the compressed information, and then be able to reconstruct based on the fact that I know that it should be compressible. It's something. It's not anything. Okay? Because I know it's something. Okay? It doesn't have to be just an MR image. It could be also a video. It could be a multi-dimensional, six-dimensional, <coughs> nth-dimensional signal. But again, the same things would apply whether I can just sense the compressed information, make fewer measurements, and still be able to reconstruct the signal. Uh, so this idea is due to Candace and, uh, and Donahoe, where a lot of the mathematical theory have, have been developed, but there's a lot of work that's been done since then in this type of area. So if we talk about compression, yeah. So this is, uh, this is what you look in here, is a piece of a Pink Floyd, like this is, uh, I'm plotting a 1D signal from uh, out of Pink Floyd. Um, probably we'll turn this off a little bit. Um, and if you just think about, you know, is this compressible? And let me argue, yeah, audio is definitely compressible. It really changed the whole industry. The fact that I can take a raw, if you look at raw audio, 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit stereo, it's about 1.3 uh, uh, megabits per second, okay, something like this. This is 1378 kilobits per second. Uh, but if you look at MP3s, same thing. You can go down to 128 kilobits per second and maintain the audio quality. Now, some of you audiophiles will say, well, you know, one, I can hear 128 kilobits per second. Let me argue 384 is just, you know, like you're, you must be a, a dog or something that will be able to hear those differences with 384 kilobits per second, which is still a compression, right? So, yes. I don't know. Are there any audiophiles in the audience? Audiophiles? No? Last, last semester we had. They're really into audio. OK, so this is about 10.7 fold compression, right? Changes the whole, change the whole industry. The fact that you can you know, take a whole CD and you put basically that in this small device, you know, uh, iPods, MyPods, you know, MP3 players, and so on and so forth. Now your phone. Uh, so it's really, really cool, right? Um, okay, so this is 1D that you can compress, and it's a factor of 10, for, some, for example, audio. Now, what about images? Well, if you take an image, a raw image is about 24 bits per pixel. Okay, So every pixel will be uh, 24. Uh, then if you look at how, what size of an image should be, then you can calculate, you know, it's, it should actually be about tens of megabytes. 
you know, sometimes hundreds of megabytes in terms of size, if you just you know, need to represent this. But of course, images don't take hundreds of megabytes. Right? Your camera compresses them into JPEG format. And if you look at a JPEG format of this particular uh, image, 1280 by 960, <coughs> normal compression, because there's rates that you can compress more, you can compress less, so on and so forth, but normal type of compression gives you 1.09 bits per pixel on average. Okay? So the amount of bits that you need for a pixel, because there's so much redundancy in images, across color, across space, um, then I can compress this by you know, 20, a factor of 20, compared to a factor of 10 that I was in, you know, in this one dimension. Okay? So it is more compressible. Anyway, so then if you think of a raw uh, video, right? <laughs> That's right. If you think of a raw video, and this is small size for 80 by 360, okay, compared to like HD video or like 4K video that we have, you know, in today's, uh, stop looking at the video. So <laughs> look, look at what I'm saying here. Fourth, you know, that kind of size. If you do all this. You know, you know, number of frames per second, bits per pixel, plus 44.1 kilohertz of audio, right, that you have to add to a video, then uh, that will give you about uh, uh, 100,000 kilobits per second. Right? That's a lot. That's, that's, that's pretty nasty if you need to store this, right? But obviously, that's not the, you know, that's not what we do. And if you just look at MPEG-4, with a you know, really high quality compression with 1300 kilobits per second, you can get amazing quality of video just because you're exploiting, again, the spatial, temporal, color space, all these redundancies in order to compress this into a smaller size. This is because it's something, it's not anything. So I can reduce the rate, okay, rate of information, if you think about this, the, how many bits are being streamed to you uh, just by exploiting those redundancies. Questions? Are you familiar with compression? Who's not familiar with compression before? Not familiar. Okay. All right. So the way the compression is often works, and here's pay attention here, right? You uh, most almost all compression algorithms use some some form of transform coding. Okay, we learned about some of these transformations. MP3 uses the discrete cosine transform, similar, same same but different than DF, DFT in the sense that DCT only uses a cosine basis as opposed to a DFT which uses a complex exponential. Again, orthogonal transformation. JPEG uses two-dimensional DCT. Okay. JPEG 2000 uses wavelets. Okay, we learned about wavelets. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering why I, I, don't, I don't remember everything that you said. Maybe I'll ask you again. Um, right. Yeah. So they came in 2000, and by 2000, storage is improved. So, um, you know, the complexity of switching to a new algorithm, uh, you know, is really wasn't need so much. I mean, you can compress using JPEG 2000 much more, okay, for the same, uh, you know, quality than, uh, than JPEG. But then, you know, it wasn't such as a, of a big deal in that sense. So that's why. But in fact, uh, Wavelet, Type of coding uses like Skype, and like you can actually look at those images. They, you know, I don't know exactly what they do, but it's obvious to me that they are doing some sort of a wavelet type of uh, image communication. At least they do did in the past. Now I don't know. I mean, they might be changing them. So, various form of wavelet type of compression is used for image communication too. Um, MPEG uses DCT and time differencing, but now you know even other things like this. So they look at uh, they also predict motion between frames 
and then compress, you know, store only after the you compensate for those motions, uh, and things like this. So again, to uh, improve the ability to uh, exploit spatial temporal information. So the way it works is you take a signal, then you apply a sparse transformation. Okay, so you take the signal and then you start sweeping it to coefficient. You know, like you have signals everywhere, you start sweeping it to places where a lot of the energy just uh, goes to a few coefficients as opposed to spreading everywhere. Okay, I showed you an example with wavelets, right, where we compute the wavelet transform of a brain image or or Lina, and you saw that. Most of the energy is concentrated along edges or things like this and not everywhere else. So you get some sparse representation. You take the sparse coefficients and then you apply quantization to them. Okay, so now you discretize them and you can quantize certain parts more or less. And they use the, uh, um, the human per per uh, perceptual uh, system models in order to find which coefficients you can um, quantize more. Um, and then what they do is what's called entropy coding. Uh, entropy coding, I don't know, if you probably went through 70, you learn about Hoffman coding, right? Did you, ever, every, nobody, everybody knows what Hoffman coding is? This is sort of uh, entropy coding where uh, you've got some redundancies and then you build a certain dictionary and then you can represent the whole thing in a smaller size. Okay, so you build the statistics and then you exploit the statistics of those coefficients. So what I really want to talk about is this part, the sparse transform. Because this is the, yeah. No, it's discrete domain right now. Yeah. Yeah, how would you compute a sparse transform continuous domain? So uh, here's a sparse transformation. If I take uh, an audio signal, that's the same audio that you've seen before, it's just one piece, uh, about 3,500 coefficients out of that uh, piece from Pink Floyd. And then what I do is I break it into uh, 512 by, and 512 uh, blocks, and I compute the DCT on each one of these blocks. And what you see is that most of the coefficients are concentrated in the what's called the low frequencies, or <coughs> are moved to the first part of the DCT, and very few go show up later. Okay, so it gives you some sort of a sparse representation uh, in that sense. So then, if I quantize this, at some point those will go to zero. You know, coefficients over here will go to zero. Here you'll have maybe more error. Here you have less error in them because you will quantize them less, maybe. Okay, and you would store those coefficients as opposed to storing the original coefficients. Yes. Yes, it's a window. Yeah, you take windows, non-overlapping windows, and then you just perform DCT on them. Okay, that's used in uh, MP3. Um, here's what you can see with images. Images is the same thing. Uh, you will take eight by eight blocks out of the image, and you compute DCT coefficients. And I don't know if you can see from far away, but let me turn off the light. you'll see that in places where the image is pretty smooth, there's only just one DCT coefficient which represents the DC, right? the, uh, the mean of, the, of that block. So just one coefficient. Okay? This is pretty much flat. So just really one coefficient is really strong. The rest are zero. In places where you have edges, then you see more coefficients. Okay? Here, there's an edge more coefficients. Here there's structure, more coefficients. But mostly it's really, really sparse. Okay? And so if I sort coefficients in the image based on their intensity, starting from large to small, then you get the blue line. It means that all of them are pretty high in terms of intensity. After performing the DCT, I get lots of lo very few large coefficients and then the rest are just dropping like flies. Okay. That means that if I basically crop anything below this line, I will get a better approximation to the image, whereas I can't really do that here. I can't really crop. Okay. But here, if I crop and then I reconstruct, I will still get a really good image because most of the energy is already stored in the 
these coefficients. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, so this is one example of trans sparse transform. What about this one? Uh, what sparsifying transform would you use here? Har is a good one, yeah, because Har represent um, piecewise constant signals. What else? Finite differences is really right. It, finite differences and finite differences is really the uh, f the finest scale of the Har transform. Right? You look at the just the finite differences. Uh, basically, that's what it does, uh, but without decimation. So if I take finite differences between um, each pixel, each pixel or each you know time point then I would get really a sparse representation, right? I'm probably missing here the DC component, right? If I just look at differences, so I need to store the DC component. Remember the plug, right? We have to store that, too. So there's one extra component, but when you take finite differences of 256 signal, you end up with 255. The 256 one will be the, the DC then, okay, that you'd want to store. And then that represents the entire signal, right? It represents anything. Like, I didn't really remove information by doing this, right? All the information is kept, OK? So depending on what signal you have, you can kind of come up with transformations that, for a class of particular signals, you can get a sparse representation, OK? Finite differences is, good, is a good one for piecewise constant signals. Wavelets or DCT or things like this would be, or uh, uh, Blockwise DCT are good for images and videos, right? and so on and so forth. So, what is really the beauty about sparsity? Right? So, sparsity and compressibility. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. And I want to talk about sparsity and noise. We kind of touched this in the past, right? We talked about sparsity and noise and why is it powerful. I mean, what are sparse signals? Sparse signals really are, you know, something like this, right? That is a sparse signal. You agree? You agree it's sparse? You agree? Actually, it looks like an NMR spectrum. Kind of. Okay. Is this a sparse signal? Uh, it's kind of sparse, right? Relatively. How many non-zero coefficients? It's, you know, if you count the number of non-zero coefficients in the image, I mean, most of the coefficients are really in these blood vessels through the hand. Right? But the rest are kind of very low. Yeah? Well, it depends. If you account for noise, then, yeah, below a certain threshold. Yeah. So how many non-zero coefficients, how many uh, large coefficients compared to very low ones? Okay, that's another form of sparsity that you can think of. Now, what is maximally not sparse? Something flat, right? That's everywhere. Uh, let me argue that actually noise signals are maximally not sparse. They're always going to be everywhere. Chances of an, some, some pixel being zero because of noise, very, very <coughs> unlikely. Okay, if you think of probability, it actually goes to zero. It's probability. Okay? Hmm? What do you mean by a gradient? Yeah, every, well, I mean, there's a lot of non-sparse signals. Like, just a constant signal is not sparse, OK? But let me argue that noise is maximally sparse. And noise, actually, if I try to do any transformation on it, it's still going to be maximally not sparse. Like, it's really non-compressible, because that's the definition of noise. It's just, we, you know, especially if it's white uh, and, and independent, then there's just no way that you can compress it. Because it means that basically you don't have any correlations and nothing that you can exploit to, uh, to store it. Okay? So the beauty about sparse signals is that um, once you have a noisy sparse signal, then it's really easy to separate between most of the, you know, the, sig the uh, signal and the noise. Most of the signal and the noise, right? There's still the coefficients that are sparse are going to be corrupted by some noise, but the rest is not affecting anything. So it's really easy to denoise it, but it's not just easy to denoise. It's easy to denoise by just applying threshold. Simple operation that's adaptive to the signal because the signal is sparse. Okay? So we're not going to really touch our signal. I mean, the, the problem with denoising often 
is that you would, while trying to remove noise, you remove your, you know, some of your signal. Okay, it's like you you've got your you know your uh, your kitchen uh, you know you, you're working and you're cutting some stuff and oh it's like all a mess. Now the kitchen you've you spilled some some you know coloring on it and like you want to clean it. And as you clean it, you're going to scratch the surface, and you know you, ah, right? So you remove, but you also remove some of the signal. Okay, so that's terrible. People get upset, you know. Your partner gets upset. Your spouse gets upset. You know, just, you don't want to live in that situation. I wonder where I got this analogy. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so my point is. I made these a while ago, so I thought maybe I'll use them for something at least. So the point is that if you have a sparse signal, then you can set a threshold, and basically, you know, by lifting your signal up above the noise, you can recover this. Okay, so it's e makes it easy to separate between uh, signal and noise. Uh, this is me, and this is John Pauly, the faculty at Stanford. Okay. All right. So the thing is that if your signal is not sparse, for example, this signal is not sparse, you can still make it sparse. And this particular signal, it's called the Chef Logan Phantom, used to do all sorts of uh, simulations of medical imaging. Um, it is definitely not sparse, but it's sparse by finite differences. So if you think about this being noisy, I can compute this and then threshold and then reconstruct back, right? So I can do some operation to remove the noise significantly by doing this. And of course, of the case of like a brain image, uh, if I compute the wavelet transform, this is the two-dimensional wavelet transform. And if you remember what a two-dimensional wavelet transform would be, is you take uh, you know a high pass and then a low pass, right, and then decimate, right. And then in two dimensions, you'll take a high pass in one D. And then you can also take high pass in this direction. You can take a high pass in this, and then followed by a high pass in this. Okay, so this is a high pass just in this direction. So you see edges only in this direction. This is a high pass in this direction. So you see edges in this direction. And this is a high pass here and a high pass here. So you only see edges on the diagonal. Okay. Uh, and this is the low low pass part that has been again separated into high pass and low pass component, and then high pass and low pass until you get to the bottom of it. And you see that's definitely sparse, right? So this represents the high frequency components. Uh, but again, you can see where they are, those high frequency components. Again, time frequency, right? You know, the tiles that we were talking about, and then so on and so forth. Um, so now if I threshold these, if I do that, then I can remove with uh, a lot of the noise, but keep the signal, okay? most of the signal. It's minimally touching the signal. And so now when I reconstruct, this is how it looks. I mean, look at this. It's just beautiful denoising. Right? If you actually try to compare, you know, all the edges here are, you know, are saved. It's just beautiful denoising that exposes the underlying signal, even though it was corrupted with noise. Now, you can think of, yeah, I can take a vacuum cleaner, for example, do uh, like a local averages, and, but then when I hit an edge, I, I'm going to switch to a you know, smaller filter and maybe along the edge. The beauty about this type of denoising is that once it's sparse, it's really easy to remove. So it's kind of like adaptive. Just by setting a threshold, adapts to the signal. Then I can think of these kind of signals, so like a heart changing over time. You know, it's kind of quasi-periodic. So if I take a Fourier transform over time, then it becomes sparse. It only has a few harmonics. I can then set a threshold and then remove the noise. You can also have a sparse representation there. You can also think of temporal as, as, well, as, well, as, as well as spatial transformation, too. Okay? So combining, let's say, the wavelets with a Fourier transform over time, and so on and so forth. Okay? So how sparsity relate to compression is because you all really only need to store the zeros, right? And I showed you this before. Uh, here's compression to 3%. Here's compression to 4%. Here's compression to 5%, you know? And so on and so forth. So that's, that's the beauty about sparsity, and that's how we relate. So how does this relate to compressed sensing? Well, um, 
What the Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem, it really just gives you a, a worst case for any band limited signal. Any band limited signal. It's the worst case. So I need to sample at that rate in order to reconstruct, but that's kind of a worst case scenario. If I have noise at that rate and it's band limited, sorry, if I have noise and it's band limited, I will be able to reconstruct it. Okay? With compressive sensing, what you are trying to do is recover the signal statistics from a few number of non-adaptive linear measurements. So we're going to make measurements, but we're going to make them non-adaptively, but try to be able to reconstruct those sparse signals okay, out of these measurements. So it kind of integrates both the compression as well as the sampling at the same time. Okay? Now it is based on concept of incoherency between signal and measurements, and I'm going to try to show you what it means. Okay? So here's where we start uh, moving, and then you, uh, I hope, are going to be catching up so let's talk a little bit about traditional sensing. Now, what I'm going to assume that right now is look at a situation where we actually have a signal that we sampled, and we're going to go for a lower rate. Okay. Okay. In our, the case that we had before, we let's say we have sampled a signal. Now we're going to downsample that signal even further. Okay. That simplifies things because we're not dealing with a continuum. Okay. But let's assume that we have a signal now, okay? And the signal is a vector of size n. According to the, um, um, first principle of linear algebra, in order to you know, in order to measure a signal of size n, I need to make n measurements. Okay? Otherwise, there's no way for me to reconstruct that signal. So what would the desktop scanner do? Desktop scanners, they t measure one pixel at a time. Right? They have, you know, you scan. One pixel at a time. If you think of a CCD, it's also one pixel at a time in parallel. Okay? So that's also what a CCD does. And if you think about what this type of measurement is, is really comp multiplying the identity matrix with your signal. This is the form of measurements. You measure one pixel at a time, either in parallel or sequentially, but one pixel at a time. Okay? So the identity matrix is you know, one that makes n linear measurements of your signal. Now, we can think of other type of measurements. For example, in my area, we measure the Fourier coefficients of the signal. Measuring Fourier coefficients of the signal is having a sensing matrix which is looking like this. This is just the real part of the Fourier matrix of the D uh, of the DFT. And this is just the real part of the DFT. And then basically, I'm going to make inner product. So this is in, taking the inner product with this and this will give me the DC component, right? And taking this one will give me another frequency. And taking an inner product with the, this one is another frequency, and so on and so forth. So this is, again, another form of sensing, but now this is sensing units using the DFT matrix. I still need to make n linear measurements. Okay, still need to make n linear measurements. Now, I can also think of arbitrary sensing, where all I need is some basis that I take in our products with my signal, and I make measurements. That could still be. And so the question is, what is a good sensing matrix? What's a good sensing matrix? What's a good sensing matrix? Orthonormal. Orth well, orthogonal, at least, right? Whether it's orthonormal or orthogonal. Uh, right, orthogonal. Why? Because every measurement that I make is completely different. Gives me new information than the other measurements. That's touche. Duspoint. So a good sensing matrix is the one that is orthogonal. If you take the matrix and you basically multiply with its conjugate, or complex conjugate, if the case of complex matrices, it should be like the identity. That means that every measurement that I make is the same amount of it. You know, it's not amplified or attenuated. And each measurement is different than the other. 
sweet. DFT matrix does that? Yeah, for sure. The identity matrix does that? Yes. Identity times identity is identity. Okay. And you can also come up with arbitrary orthogonal, orth orthogonal basis that will also give that to you. Okay. Any questions for that? Right. This is this is relatively basic. I don't know if you've seen this in this form, but I hope you understand that you need at least n measurements. Otherwise, you will not get the identity. You'll get some zeros. If you get some zeros, that means that you are. Well, I would say, you know. Well, I don't want to swear on video, but you really don't have an option there, right? You really, I mean, that's a problem, right? You cannot invert a matrix, right? That it's not invertible. If this is not invertible, that is a problem, okay? You want it at least to be invertible, but a good one will be also orthonormal, okay? So you have equal measurements of everything. All right. So what is compressed sensing? The situation of compressed sensing is different. What do you have now is you have a signal still of length n. Okay. Still the same size. Now you make fewer measurements than n. Okay. You make fewer measurements. So fewer linear projections, linear inner products with this vector. How many? Well, turns out this vector, though, is sparse. This vector is, only has k sparse coefficients, k non-zero coefficients. So much fewer than n. Okay? And we're going to make m linear measurement. And m is, any, is somewhere between this n and k. Okay? More than the sparse coefficients, less than n. Okay? And I'm going to say that they're incoherent projections. What does it mean even? I'll show you what I mean. But the idea here for compressed sensing, what will be a good compressed sensing matrix? Really, I want to figure out what this is from this measurement. That sounds difficult. Because I have fewer measurements, right? I have fewer measurements. Actually, if you think about this, if I knew the locations of these, if I knew the locations, right, that would be easy. Because that basically shrinks this matrix, right? I can remove whatever is multiplied with zero. So in fact, I would have a smaller matrix that only operates on this. Then I could potentially be able to invert if I knew exactly what they are, what the position of these coefficients. Then it would become trivial. And as long as I have m bigger than k, then I'm good. And it's an orthogonal and so on and so forth. But now that's not the case. I know that there's a few. I just don't know where they are. Okay, so I can't do that. As it turns out, a good compressed sensing is the one that is approximately orthogonal. It can never be orthogonal. If you take an inner, this, uh, you know, uh, phi uh, transpose conjugate times phi, can never be orthogonal because it is wide, right? So if I take this multiplied by this, can never be orthogonal because it's a higher dimensional space. I mean, it's just not possible to create orthogonal. If you take two vectors and you take the outer product between them, I mean, it'd never be orthogonal. The matrix could not, you know, it's just not possible. Okay? So if I do that, I will get, though, what's, what's, what I'm looking for is something that looks like an identity, but it will have some off-diagonal components. We'll have some off-diagonal components, but those will be low. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> exactly what it means. That when you look at the what's called this is called a gram matrix, or the outer product of this phi, if that looks like a strong uh, diagonal with very low off-diagonal elements, that means it's a form of saying that they're incoherent. So the peak to, si to side lobe ratio, if you think about this, the peak of the diagonal with respect to the maximum off-diagonal elements, that is a form of incoherence. There's other form that people have defined. But the interesting here, what basically it says is that every vector that I use to measure is, you know, it has some information about the next one, 
right? Because they're not orthogonal. But that overlap is small. That's what it means. The overlap between two vectors, because what I, I'm doing here is I'm taking inner products between vectors, really, of my basis, of my uh, encoding matrix. Each one of them has very low interference. So every measure that I make is, you know, it's, there is some mutual information, but that mutual information doesn't overlap so much. That's what it means. So I'm running out of time, so I'm probably going to uh, spend... Uh, you know, Monday uh, after the thing as well. But what I want to say is, given, so here's the, really the problem. Given y equals phi times x, I want to find x. Now this is underdetermined, so there's infinite number of solutions that can give me this. Infinite. However, the question is whether there's an infinite sparse solution that gives me this. And because, K, because this vector is not everything, it's not Anything, it's something. It is sparse. Maybe I can do something about this. Okay. So what people, what, what thing that people usually do when they have this underdetermined set of equations, they say, well, how about I will look for all the among all possible solutions that satisfy this linear equations, I'm going to look for the one that has lowest energy. Okay? Turns out it's wrong. You're guaranteed almost to not get a sparse solution if you do this. What else you could do? I'm going to steal one more, uh, two more minutes, if that's okay. Because I, I want to... What else you can do? Well, how about I'll try all possible vectors. I'll try everything. Everything I will try. All possible sparse vectors. I'll try them all. Does this fit? No. Does this fit? No. Does this fit? No. Infinite combinations. I'll try all of them. Okay? If I do that... That is amount for minimizing what's called the L0 norm of the cardinality. You know, among all possible solutions, I'm going to look for the sparsest ones. I'm going to try, let's try all the ones with one coefficient. Let's try all the ones with two coefficients, with all combinations. And I'll try all these with three coefficients, and so on and so forth. I'm just going to try everything till I find a solution. Okay? Turns out that this would actually work, but it's also very hard. Now, it will work on some assumptions on phi and some assumption on x. It might work, okay? but it is hard. But the beauty about those ideas is that if you actually solve among all possible solutions, the one that have a minimum L1 norm, which is just the sum of absolute values of x, if you minimize that, it turns out that you only need k log n number of measurements. There are some restrictions on phi, but if you have k sparse signal, you only need k log n order of coefficients for certain kinds of phi. And that will guarantee that it will solve the hard problem. But the cool thing about L1 norm minimization is that it's solved by linear programming, it's convex, has very fast computation in order to do this. So by solving a Convex problem, you can solve the non-convex problem. The hard one, the combinatorial one. And that really changes everything. And I will finish with just a very simple geometrical interpretation. Whether you see it, well, you're able to see it or not. The domain of sparse signals in three dimensions. Okay, Let me argue is signals on the axis E. This dot over here is sparse in 3D. Why? Because it exists on the axis. Right? It means that he has at least two, in this case, two zero coefficients, right? It's, uh, it lies on you know, the z-axis, z equals zero, but also on y equals zero. Okay, so it's sparse in 3D. All these vectors are sparse in 3D. All these lie somewhere on the axis. Okay? Those are sparse signals. Now, let's say I want to, I want to, this is a signal, right? This is a coordinate. It's a three-dimensional signal, right? That's co it's a coordinate. I want to measure this. If I make one measurement, one inner product with my signal, and I, I'm going to take an arbitrary inner product, that's going to define a pl or actually I'm going to make, yeah, one. 